And in a way, hello to everybody that's looking and watching and doing tonight. Tonight will be a good night. We're about the laws of relationships. So we're going to talk to the men tonight about how to love your wives like Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. Five laws for you. And then next week we'll talk about five laws for the women on how to respect her husband and uh, talk about the difference and so forth and what we need and why we need to do this. And I'll tell you what I've observed for 43 years of pastoring about this in relationships. Relationships are among the major, major categories of life that affect people, affect us, um, and, and everything that happens in our life and everything our lives are about and all that kind of stuff. So we'll do that. Listen, I want to start off in first, and I, I don't really want to talk about this, uh, no offense, but especially on, on, on camera about this because there's so much speculation and there's so much that we don't know about or anything and there's no reason to discuss a lot of things about it but i do want us to pray uh for the people the church that is in sutherland let's see sutherland springs isn't it yeah sutherland springs in texas that was today a gunman came in and killed a bunch of people killed sounds sounds like about half the congregation were killed and the other half were wounded. So what they said, usually about 50 people are at church every Sunday, and they got 25 to 27 that are dead, and then they got anywhere from uh, 10 to 30, they said, that are wounded. So that sounds like everybody that was there at church today got wounded or shot. And, um, and so anyway, so it's such a tragedy, such a you know, terrible thing. So I want us to just start off our class. I just want to pray for them and pray that um, for the for for the safety and the and the lives of some that are wounded that um, and some that are of course you don't know how what kind of emotions and and all that that's going through. I mean, it just has to be total shock of the whole thing and the whole area. So anyway, let let's 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 pray for them. Father, we live before you, a people that we we don't even know, but. Lord, we're connected to. They're part of this. They're part of the family of God. They're part of your people. Yes. And Lord, we our hearts go out. Our compassion, our sympathy yes. goes to the people of of Sutherland Springs, Texas. That Lord, you would touch that situation and that life. I have no idea uh, of what what kind of things are needed there. But, Lord, you do, and, and our hearts are just with you. Our hearts are with what can be done uh, to, for peace for the people's lives and for, for comfort from your Holy Spirit. And, and, Lord, we pray that you might bless that, that, that investigation and the things that need to be exposed and the things that can be exposed. And we pray for wisdom for everybody involved in all of this. And, Lord, we, we just we, we pray for your protection and your safety. It could have been us. It could have been any of us at, at any moment. And, we, and, Lord, we just pray for wisdom for all of us in the future to know what we need to do and, and how to protect as much as possible ourselves and our congregations from, from these, uh, these uh, crazy uh, type of, of violence that's here. And, Lord, we, we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen, amen, amen. All right. All right. Yeah, we'll be uh, considering in the days to come our own congregation and so forth. So anyway, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but wanted to start off by just calling your attention to one passage of Scripture. Actually, it's two verses. But it's one, it's one passage. It's in Ephesians 5. Anytime you want to talk about relationships and talk about husbands and wives, you're, you're going to have to go to Ephesians 5 because in Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul talks about um, husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. As a matter of fact, verse 25 of Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wife. It's on your sheet, your scripture sheet. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 26 says that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And it goes on to describe how a husband is to love his wife. And then it concludes with talking to a wife about how she should respond to her husband. And then in, I think it's verse, uh, I think it's verse 30 
um, or 31, it's the last verse of the chapter, and I'm sorry that for right now at the moment it just springs. Y'all ever have that <laughs> where something just springs out of your mind? It's like, it's like what, is that 30 or 30? You never have any of that. <laughs> well, just imagine it if you did. Uh, let me just say that it's verse 33 because I had it written on my note here, so I would make sure I could remember. Verse 33, I just usually quote all of that, and it's the last verse in the chapter, and it says, um, so, let a, so let a husband so love his wife, and the wife see that she respects her husband. Or rev the old King James word was reverences yeah. her husband. So according to the scripture, though that that's not just a little, um, a, a little, um, oh, what would we call it? Uh, uh, a little choice of words difference there is is not the apostle's way of saying husbands love your wife and wife love your husband. I mean he does that on purpose because those those are two different things. We need two different things uh, from each other. That's. That's for us to notice. It says, wives love your, I mean, husbands love your wife like Christ loves her. And then you wives see that you reverence mm -hmm. your husband. Notice it does not say husbands love your wives and wives love your husbands. Mm -hmm. It uses the word reverence, which is another word for um, respect, uh, which is another word for honor or worship, actually, mm -hmm. would be a good word. Now, we understand that the scripture is not teaching us, ladies, to worship our husbands like we worship the Lord. That like as if he is on the same par with the Lord. It's not talking about a competing interest here. That but it is talking about with the same type of reverential respect that you give to the Lord, that in that same vein you, you treat your husband this way, because if you'll do this he will interpret that as love. So it's like we see through different glasses. You know, we, you've hear, heard, uh, you see the world through rose-colored glasses. Well, according to Ephesians 5.33, men and women see love in, in, through different glasses. And women interpret being loved by certain activities. And men men understand that they are loved by different activities, by other activities. Now, our problem is two things. Number one, we don't understand that there's a difference, or we interpret what we need to give our mate by what we sense that we need. So either one of those will we'll get a relationship messed up because you will have one, one partner giving the other partner everything that they know to give and what they know or what they, they, their feeling is, okay, I need to leave him notes. I need to give him little reminder gifts. I need to um, pamper him and pet him. I need to uh, let him know that he marches at the head of the parade and I love nothing more than him. And, 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 and you think that that's conveying love but it's really not being received that way. So the frustration builds like, I'm doing everything I can, to, you know, and, and why isn't this helping? Well, it's because that's not what he needs. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, it's not that it's not appreciated. I mean, anybody appreciates somebody being sweet to them and nice. And I mean, It's not like it's completely unnoticed, but it doesn't feel the need that we have as men to know that we're loved and respected. And uh, in other words, men take respect and interpret it as love. When we're being respected, that's our, our life, our glasses that we're looking through are going, she loves me, she loves, you know. And so anyway, I, I, maybe that'll kind of explain a little bit about why it's really important. It's really, really important that you understand this. Because my testimony to you is after 43 years of pastoring and dealing with people and dealing with relationships uh, in the most intimate ways and in the most um, uh, passionate environments and, and, and disagreements and in the, in the depths of people's issues in life. I, my testimony to you is if you do not 
have these ten things, you're not, you're not going to make it. I mean, you're just not going to make it. Now, if you do have these things, there's a chance that you won't make it because mm -hmm. anybody can mess up stuff, <laughs> you know. Anybody can take, I mean, you can take two people that really love each other and respect each other, and you can do things that so mess up this relationship that, it, that it, only the Holy Spirit could put it back together again. So you can take some, you can take people who really share these ten things, and they can mess it up so bad that it can't be helped. But you, if, you, if you don't have these ten things, no matter what you do, it's not going to help. I mean, you can be the best on a lot of other things in the world that you could possibly be, but it still ain't going to work because the, this is the basis of a love relationship between uh, a man and a woman. This is what the Scripture says. You know, Paul said to sum it all up in verse 33. To, Husbands do this, blah, 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 and then wives do this, blah, 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 blah. And then one verse at the end says, all right, now to sum it all up, uh, you husbands so love your wife as Christ loved the church, and you wives see that you respect your husbands. Mm -hmm. And he says, now that's the conclusion of everything. So it's really, really important. And, and I'm just saying that to you to say, all right, these five things that I'm about to share tonight are going to be talking to the men about how to show your wife that you love her. The verse says, you husbands so love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And then it turns around and says, and you women, you, you respect your husband. So next week we'll be dealing with the five things that women can do to show their husbands their respect that he will interpret as love. When you do it, when you do it, the glasses that he's viewing life through will say, she, she loves me. I'm her man. You know, this is good. And he'll be built up by this. Uh, and it's going to be different than the five things you need in life to show that you are loved by your man. And um, now I know that everybody in here, you know, you have deep relationships. Many of you have been married Many, many years. I know you have. I mean, uh, Tanya and I have been married 40 years. Uh, so we obviously have found the key to it, you know. <laughs> and uh, some of you have been married 25 years, 27 years, 30 years, uh, you know, 40, some maybe even more than that. And you've obviously found the key to your relationships. Some of you are young, younger, and you're just getting started in relationships. And so these are going to be helpful to you, very helpful. Some of you that have been married a long time, even though you may have figured out what it is that you do with each other, you may not have been able to label it so that you could share it with some, other, some others that you love. Because you do have children and you have grandchildren and you have people in your life that you love and you'd love to be able to say, hey, uh, when they talk to you about, man, I don't know what in the world's going on with my marriage. It just seems good tonight. We can't just get going in the same direction. And mom, mama or granny or papa or whatever, you know, is, is what, I mean, what's the key? You guys have been married a long time. What is it that, 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 that does that for you? And then you have some answers. You say, okay, here... Here is what makes a marriage stable. This is what happens. And I guarantee you that those of you that have good love relationship, now I'm not talking about you living with somebody that you're just tolerating, <laughs> which that can be so. You know it. You know I'm telling you the truth. You know that there are, there are many people that they live in relationship to each other because either they don't want to divorce from each other because it's too messy and it's too, you know, it just throws everything up and you're going to lose half your stuff or more than half your stuff and, and the, the, we'll just live together and live in two separate bedrooms and we'll just be two ships passing in the night and we'll just keep this thing going even though it's not real anymore. Or you live in a loveless relationship where there's no passion, there's no love, there's no tenderness, there's no you know, give and flow. There's nothing that really concerns about each other, but, but you you just conveniently just kind of stay in it together. So I'm not saying that you can't stay in the same house with each other without having this. I'm just saying that you're not going to have the passionate love relationship that the Bible intends marriage to be uh, if you don't have these 10 things in your life. 
all right? And, and the more of these 10 things you have, the better. Like if you have a couple of men and w rules and a couple of women rules, you, you, that might be enough to kind of keep things moving a little, but the more you add, the better it's going to get. And when you get all five of them moving in the same direction against all five, then you're going to have the basis. You're going to have the, the, the foundation for building a great love relationship so that you can be together 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, and, and still be passionate about, to each other. And by passionate, I'm not talking about like some wild Tarzan and Jane swinging from some tree somewhere, you know, uh, <laughs> acting like teenagers, you know. But I'm talking about, I'm talking about you can really love somebody deeply, they, you know. <laughs> You can still have those goosebumps going up and down your spine. You can still light up when they come into the room. Mm -hmm. You know you know what I mean? If you watch people that love each other, and you'll see that when one of them's in, like if one of them's in here and the, and the other one comes through that door, they, can, they don't even have to see it. They can just sense that they're in the room, and they'll begin to look around. And when they look around, it's like their heart just kind of elevates just a little bit because you love them, mm -hmm. and, and it matters. You know, it matters. And that's what you want. That's the kind of relationship you want. Mm -hmm. Because as we all know, those of us that are older and been married a long time, been married a long time, I'm going to tell you something that's true. You know, uh, just like Proverbs says in Proverbs 31, beauty fades and passions get, you know, get or become different. And what what was the key interest in young marriages are not the same as older marriages, and it kind of goes away, and I think that you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there are stronger things than that. There are deeper things than that that hold us and keep us and make us secure and, 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 um, and fulfill our lives. I mean, it, my life right now as a 62 61? How old am I? Anyway, 61. I'm 61. I, I'm moving at 62 in March. Y'all don't forget that. Um, as, a, as that old of a person, um, I, can, I can tell you, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like I used to be. I, I used to be, you know, just a, a, a wild, uh, passionate, virile, testosterone-filled, uh, normal male uh, whose life was focused in certain areas as far as uh, needs and desires and so forth. And, and, and now I'm, uh, I'm not driven by those same things. I mean, my life has moved on, you know. It's not like that's not important, but it means I'm not just overwhelmed with it. It's not driving me. It's not, you know, it's not the center of my thought life and all of that kind of stuff. And that's the way life is. Life moves on. Life, and, and we all know this, that there has to be something deeper than just these carnal uh, physical issues of life that will hold you together as you move on in life and you can grow on together. I mean, it's just, that's just normal life. Right. And, and so you want this to be true about you. So how, does this, how, how can this be true? Mm -hmm. What can you do? What is, what is the key to this? And I'm just saying that these five rules for men and these five rules for women, they're not, they're not the only thing, but they are the major things that really every relationship has to have and every relationship needs. So let's just go in here and let's talk to the men about how to love your wives as Christ loved the church. What would you need to do? You say, okay, what do I do? do every day I get home, do I walk in and say, I love you, I love you, you know I love you. I love you, baby. I really do. I mean, deeply. I really love you. And you know I love you. And you I mean, is that, is that going to be the answer? I mean, is that what she needs? Uh, is, uh, how would you, if Christ says you love your wife like Christ loves the church, and I'm telling you that she needs to know that, that this sense that you love her is a major emotional need of her life, 
that, and you need to fill it, the, is that going to be how it does? Every time you think of it, you say, hey, babe, just, I know I hadn't said it enough today to you, but I love you. You know I love you. And then um, 20 minutes later, or something else happens, and you say, see, I, I mean, hey, I just want you to know I love you. You know I love, I mean, is, is that going to be what you do? And, and, well, no. I mean, how silly would that be? But it, there are some things that you can do that every time you do them, it says, I love you. And if you do these things continually, pretty soon it becomes a pattern of life. And then it's the way you become. Uh, it, it's the way you are. It's how, I, I mean, I guarantee you, and, and see, I, I, I'm going to mention myself and Tanya because, I mean, I don't know you deeply and intimately. I know some things about you, and I would have some suspicions of things that would be true about you, but I really don't know, you know, because I don't live with you, and I don't really know every deep thing about you. So I have to use some deep things about relationships to kind of share with you so you'll understand and get a grasp on it. And I, our relationship is the only one I really know really deeply, so I'm not trying to use myself as some kind of perfect example because I know you know, as great as I am, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I know as I know that I'm not perfect, and our relationship's not pu perfect. But but we have endured a lot, and we have been married a long time, and um, and so right, yeah, and only once, yeah, and so it it does illustrate some things, is what I'm saying to you. If the proof of the pudding is in the eating, then here's I mean here here's some here's some. 40 years of proof here of, of, okay, you must know something, you know, because it's endured that. So I'm just saying I'm going to use myself as an example a lot because I don't know enough about you to use you as an example. Um, and I don't think you probably will want me to use you. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, this, these are the major things of relationships, and so here they go. All right, um, number one, we're going to look at the law of sacrifice. So husbands, the number, uh, uh, the number one law for you to fulfill the commandment that Paul says in Ephesians 5, that you are to love your wife like Christ loves the church, is to fulfill the law of sacrifice. The law of sacrifice. What, what did Jesus do? to show the church that he loved the church so deeply. What did he actually do to prove that? Well, right, right. He, it, Paul says it. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church mm -hmm. and gave himself for her. So Paul says that the number one way, men, we can show our wives that we love her is to convince her and persuade her every day we live that we are willing to die for her as quickly as we would draw our next breath. What did Jesus do for the church? He died for the church. He was willing to sacrifice himself in order for the church to live. And so Paul is saying, men, your wife must know. You must convince her. You must show her by your actions, by your words, by, by your thoughts, by, by whatever means possible that you would be willing to die for her as quickly as you would draw your next breath. So it's really like a firefighter or like a soldier or like a police officer who, who they, these people take oaths that say, I'm, I'm willing to die to protect the, the citizenry of, of this community and when you quote your marriage vow that you will love her, you will honor her, you will cherish her, that you'll be a true and faithful husband, that you will cleave only to her so long as you both shall live, and you say, I do, you are, that's an oath. That's a commitment. You are saying, I'm going to... I mean, I, I'm willing to sacrifice myself and willing to do whatever it takes to protect, to provide for, and to spiritually be responsible 
for her so long as we both shall live. And you say, I do. Because the role of a man in life for his family, what are the three things that God says or shows us in the scripture that a husband is to be? Why, do God, why, do, why does God put a man in the life of a woman and draw them together and they produce children that populate the earth and that recreate the, another husband and another wife and they get together and they populate and they replenish. I mean, why does, why is that, what is, what is the husband's responsibility to protect, yep, to, right, to provide for his family? And that doesn't mean a wife can't work, but he, it means he takes responsibility. It means he makes sure that happens. If somebody, if he needs to get a second job, he does. If he needs to train himself with better skills so he can get a better job and make more money, he does. Um, if he needs to seek uh, other employment and try to better himself and get more skills and all that, he does that. Uh, he's in, he, he wants to be the best provider that he can possibly be. So he keeps pushing toward being able to provide for his family. And he's the protector of his family, which means that anything that comes against his family, and I mean anything that comes against his family, something that comes over the Internet, he's going to be sensitive to that, and he's going to notice that in the kids, and he's going to say, boy, what you watching at night on that phone you got? Give me that phone and keep them, you know, so they can't go in their bedroom and get under the covers and watch whatever is on the Internet. I mean, the dad should be the one that goes in there and says, give me that. You know, you should be paying attention to what happens with their friends. And if somebody that's a bad influence or is creating havoc in their life, then that you say that he's got to go. You never to have anything to do with that. Your dad's a good detective. Dad pays attention. Dad knows their children enough to know that something's wrong. He notices some kind of little misfires and okay, come here, son. What's wrong? What's happening? Tell me. You got to, you know. I mean, these are. This is the pr protector of your home. You would protect your home if somebody came to your door, rang your doorbell, knocked on your door, and was standing there with a shotgun. You wouldn't let that sucker in. You would go get your gun, and as soon as the door opened, boom, you know, or shoot through the door. I mean, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't just say, open up and say, hey, come on in and kill my family. Come on in and, you know, I'm not going to do anything, and you can come in here and hold us hostage and, you know, molest my family and my wife. No, no, you wouldn't do that. But that's what happens over these internet issues. You're letting some creep, some pervert in to your house, and he's killing your children. He's killing your family. He's probably uh, uh, using obscene issues and so forth to, to ruin their minds and to take them captive and all of that. So in, in other words, Dad, you've got to know. You're the one that's got to notice that. Don't make your wife be the pr pr protector of your home. You have to pay attention. It's not her responsibility. It's your responsibility. You're to protect your home from anything and from everything. And then you're the priest, which means you're the spiritual leader. Don't make your wife be the spiritual person in the family. Don't force her to be the one that gets everybody up on Sunday and says, it's time to go to church. And they go, oh, I don't want to go to church. And the wife has to be the one, get up out of that bed. We're going to church and keep hounding people. And you lay in there in your bed about half asleep, acting like it doesn't matter and, and making her be the, be the heavy and be the one that says, you, you know, uh, you get, did you study your Bible? Do you know what we're doing today? Did you pray? Did you, I mean, she, that's not her responsibility. That's your responsibility. And God holds you responsible. And so when you fulfill your responsibility as the husband and you take the responsibility of, the, of the, being the man of this family and you uh, do the things that you should do that God has created you to do, that is a way of saying to your wife, I... I, 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 I will sacrifice myself for you as quickly as I would draw my next breath. And whatever comes against your family, you're the first one. You're the first responder to everything. I don't care what it is. If it, I'll give you one example, and, and Lord bless her soul, I still don't know why this happened. But as an example, my mother, 
Um, and I love my mother to death. My mother's with the Lord now. She passed away when she was 79 years old, uh, about, about eight or nine years ago. Uh, and my mama, for some reason, I was pastoring a church in, in Meridian for, for 14 years. My mother came. My mother, was, my mother went everywhere I went. I don't care if I preached revivals or services. If she could possibly go, if it wasn't a limited congregation like a youth rally or something, my mother would be sitting on the first or second row every time I spoke. I, only Tanya's heard me preach more often than my mama did. My mama loved me. My mama supported me. My mama just was go to the ends of the earth for me. But for one, some reason, I don't know why, but one Wednesday night, um, I, was, I went home. I, we had a service, and, and I went home, and my mama was there, and uh, there was some kind of uh, confrontation with Tanya about I don't know what. It was like mama just went off the, the deep end or something, and she, she said some snarky things and some, you know, uh, some sarcastically spiteful things to Tanya as if somehow Tanya did something and now she's, you know, she's being disrespectful totally. It's like, you know, just out of the blue and all that. And so they didn't want to tell me when, when I got home, but I could tell something was wrong. And I, see, that's what I'm talking about. You have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. You have to know something is wrong, even when they won't tell you what it is. And you can say, look, babe, I know something's wrong. What is it? What? And after about 30 minutes of kind of saying, look, you got to talk to me about it because, I, look, I know something's wrong. You're not, you're not acting normal. You're not, you're, what happened? And, and finally, after about 30 minutes of me badgering her, she finally admitted, she said, well, she said, I don't really know what happened, but your mother, you know, after church tonight, uh, I went up and said, hey, how you doing? And it's good to, you know, just like I normally do. And she kind of started saying some snarky, insulting kind of things as if somehow I did something to her. And she was talking, saying this. And I said, well, did you do anything? Was there any truth in that? And she said, well, no, not that. I don't know what it could be about. And so as soon as she told me that, I got on the phone and I talked to Mama. It was about 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night. And I called her and I said, Mama, I said, you know, I finally got this out of Tanya and, tell, and, and, she, and you said this and this and this. And just tell me, all right, what's that all about? What, what, what's going on here? And she tried to, she didn't really try to make any kind of excuses. She just immediately started apologizing about it and all that kind of stuff. And I said, look, I said, is this an issue? Do we need to, I said, do I need to come over to the house or we need to get this straight? Because, I mean, this, you, you, you're not going to be able to talk to Tanya like this. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to do this with her. So do I need to come over there? Do we need to get something straightened out? Is this going to be an issue or what is it that we need to do? And she said, no. Son. And I said, well, all right, well, listen, this is what you need to do. The next time you're in her presence, you need to apologize for acting the way you acted against her because there's no reason for you to do that. And she said, I will. I'm so sorry. You know, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know what went wrong with my crazy self and all this. And Anyway, and she did it, and that was the end of it. Once she, I mean, that was, it was over with. Never really got brought up again all the rest of the time. You know, ten, the next 10, 15 years, it never got brought up again because it was over with and it was done with. But what I'm saying is that that's my mama who loved me. All right, even though that's my mama, I, I'm still protective of my wife. My wife is my first... My first love, my first, when I said, I, I will love you, I will honor you, I will cherish you, I will be your mate, I will not seek after another one, you're the only one in my life for the rest of my life, I would die for you as soon as I draw my next breath. That means against anything, against the kids. You know, I know that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of families where the kids are like exalted above everything. That's unbiblical. That's not scriptural. You were a family before you had children. Mm -hmm. Before you had children, as a husband and wife, you are one and you are, you are a family in yourself. And you bring children into the family, okay, great. That's a responsibility and you're to be responsible for your children. But you get dads, you can't love your children more than you love your wife. You cannot make her feel that way. Like, you, you can't let her think that the children mean more to you than she means to you. 
If, it, if you do, it's going to undermine your marriage. It's going to undercut her security, which means that she's going to feel insecure, and that's going to take and remove some things from her that she needs. She needs to know that she marches at the head of your parade. Yeah. And that nothing, that you love nothing more than her. You don't love your job more than you love her. You don't love the kids more than you love her. You don't love your family, your mama more than you love her. There's nothing in your life that will take precedence over her. She is number one, numero uno in your life. Now, if you can convey that to her by doing doing things that will say that, uh, then she's going to have a sense of security that she needs. It's going to uplift her life. It's going to say, every time she thinks about it, every time she sees it, it's going to say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Without you saying, saying it, you know, it's going to say, it's going to be a sense in her of, he loves me. And that's what she needs. According to the Apostle Paul, husbands, love your wives. That's what she needs. And I'll remind you that this is not a want, it's a need. You, when you need it, you need it. It doesn't mean it's just something you want. It means you got to have it. It's like air. You, you, you need air. You, you got to have it or you're going to die, you know. It's not a want, it's a need. And remember, if you're the one in need, you are saying, there's nothing more important than this. I need it. I need it. It's not that I want it. And remember, the same thing's true about your mate. They have that same feeling. So don't disrespect what they need and respect what you need. You want them to respect what you need and supply what you need. Well, on the flip side, you respect what they need and supply what they need because it is a need. It's not that they're stingy or or self-centered and they want you to you know, sacrifice for them, is that they need that. That is a need of theirs. And if you'll supply it, it'll make for a happier love relationship and a happier, happier commitment in life. It'll bring some security and it'll say, I love you. All right, we got, do we understand that? Is there any questions about that or, 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 or things you'd like to say or, or request for prayer or what? <laughs> anything like that? <laughs> It'll be so. All right, well, let's move on then. The second law. The second law is the law of honor. Now, what does it mean to honor something? 1 Peter 3, 7 says, um, and, and it's, on your, it's on your scripture script sheet, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel by the way, weaker vessel here means what? I've said it to you, I know, several times. and you'll Weaker vessel means she's not as strong as you. Now, it's not, talking about, it's not talking about spiritually or emotionally or something. It's talking about physically. In other words, you are the baddest cat in the house. Now, I know that that's not true of every single man on the face of the earth and every single woman on the face of the earth. I know a woman shot putter can whip George Jefferson any day, you know. <laughs> I know that there are some women that can, you know, just body slam some, some men. And so it's not in talking about, I mean, I know as soon as I say that, you could bring up somebody in your mind and say, well, I know they may Well, yeah, you probably can. But on the whole, in general, a man is built by God to be stronger, physically, muscular, strength-wise than a woman. And it means that... We can abuse them. We can, we can intimidate them. We, we can growl at them. We can push them around. We can physically manhandle and manipulate them if we want to. And Paul says, I, 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 you got to treat them with honor because they are weaker than you physically. You can intimidate. You can use your uh, body to uh, manipulate. Don't, don't do that. Because you are, according to the scripture that goes on, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers not be hindered. Mm -hmm. Paul says, okay, you got to treat them with honor and don't use your muscular strength to intimidate them and to push them around, but, but use, use your, remember that 
at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. That in the eyes of God, you are not more, you are not superior to her. You and you and her, you're together. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Remember that. And remember that if you want, if you want your prayers to be answered, you're going to have to treat her with honor. So what does that mean? And, and notice that it didn't say that to wives. It didn't say, you wives, you got to treat with honor your man. I mean, it's just talking to the husbands, and it says, guys, you're going to have the tendency to be the, the baddest growl in the house. You, you're going to have your tendency to be, the, to be the, uh, the papa bear and the growler and the intimidator and the, and, the, and the one that can talk the loudest and be the strongest. You've got the deepest voice in the house. You've got the most power in the house. And you're going to have the tendency at times to exalt this and use this like a weapon. If you do that, your prayers aren't going to be answered because... That's a no-no in the eyes of God. You don't do that because if you do that, you're disrespecting and dishonoring your wife. So he says, honor your wife. What does it mean to honor? Well, to honor means to be exalted. It means to lift something up. It means to treat something with value. So what is this saying? Well, it's saying, all right, you husbands, you're going to have to set your wife on a pedestal means you're going to have to lift her up as something that is highly valued, something that's highly honored. I mean, what, what do you do with, with very uh, expensive stuff or very precious stuff in your life or something that you value with, with honor? What do you do with it? Well, you protect it, right? You put it in a safe place or, or you put it on the mantle if it's something that you want to see and you want everybody to see it and, and, you want to, and when they walk in the house, it's going to be something that they go, hey, man, what's that right there? Did I see that? And then you can brag on it. You can, you can say, boy, this is really something. This is what happened and this is a picture of me and so-and-so or this is a trophy from so-and-so. I mean, in, in, in other words, um, you you. See Set something apart. You, you, you put it up as being special. That's what, that's what honoring means. Now, the, 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 the passage that shows you a little bit about why we need to honor our wives is, and I know I've mentioned it, I know it, probably others have mentioned it, Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Have any of you read Proverbs 31? It's the, it's the salute to a virtuous wife, a virtuous woman. By virtuous, it means um, um, a respected, an honorable wife. It means somebody that, that seeks the best for her family. Have you, have you ever read any of that? Yeah, li- listen to this. I, I mean, I don't, uh, I just, I really just copied this out of, out of the scripture. This is out of the Message Bible. Listen to just a, a few, few lines of this, and you can see what, the Bible considers to be an honorable wife that, is, that could be put on a pedestal. Listen to this. A good woman is hard to find. This is Proverbs 31, verse 10. Listen to this. A good woman is hard to find and worth far more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve and never has a reason to regret it. Never spiteful, she treats him generously all her life long. She shops around for the best yarns and cottons and enjoys knitting and sewing. She's like a trading ship that sails to a faraway place and brings back exotic surprises. She's up before dawn preparing breakfast for her family and organizing her day. She looks over a field and buys it. Then with the money she's put aside, she plants a garden. First thing in the morning, she dresses for work, rolls up her sleeve, eager to get started. She senses the worth of her work. She's in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She's skilled in the crafts of home and hearth, diligent in homemaking. She's quick to assist anyone in need, reaches out to help the poor. She doesn't worry about her family when it snows. 
Their winter clothes are all mended and ready to wear. She makes her own clothing and dresses in colorful linens and skills. Her husband is greatly respected when he deliberates with the city fathers. She groans, she grows and sells them, brings the sweaters she knits to the dress shop. Her clothes are well made and elegant and she always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say and she says it and she always says it kindly. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you've outclassed them all. Charm can mislead and beauty soon fades. The woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God. Give her everything she deserves and cover her life with praises. That's Proverbs 31. That's, that right there is the description of a great wife, a great woman in life, in, a, in the life of her family. Now, the, the, the scripture is telling us here that she deserves, a woman like that deserves to be honored and to be respected by her husband. Practically, how can you do this? Now, practically, I'm talking about how can you show this? Here, here's one way. Seriously. Give her the best. Give her the best. Now, everybody can't afford everything in the world. I know that. I know a lot of families struggle because their finances are really, really tight, and they have to use less than, you know, less than new kind of deals. But, but just practically speaking, uh, Give her the best automobile. You drive the junk. I mean, don't, see, that, you give her the best, it says, I love you, you're special. I don't want you to break down on the side road. If anybody breaks down, I want it to be me, so I'm gonna give you the one, the low mileage. I'm gonna give you the one that has the best tires. I'm gonna give you the one that, 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 is, that is more likely to be uh, uh, capable, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the junk in life. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna honor you. Give her the best clothes. You don't dress like a million dollar stud in life, and she wears raggedy stuff and doesn't have. I mean, give her, she, let her clothes be the pretty clothes. And you, you just, you wear the blue jeans. You take the, you take the, the junk in life. Um, give her the best uh, couch if that's where she sits, and you get, you use that recliner from uh, Goodwill or something like that. You know, you, you give her the best things in life. That says, you know, I honor you. Uh, I, when it comes to getting the last bite on a plate, it, give it to her. I mean, she, you, she, you know, babe, this is for you. You, you know, and uh, those are practical ways to say I'm lifting you above. I'm exalting you. I'm, I'm honoring you because you are so valuable and precious. I don't know what my life would be without you. You bless me in every way, and I praise you for what you are. Now, if you do that, that will be saying I love you because she will sense that she is precious in your life and you honor her. As someone, according to like Proverbs 31, who deserves that? Her husband, uh, what does it say? Her children rise up and call her blessed. And her husband agrees with that. Her husband sings her praises all of his life. And, and, Paul, and, and, and the writer of Proverbs says, give her what she deserves. She's a great, wonderful person in your life. And she supplies so many needs. Give her what she deserves. One of the things that just burns me up, and I seriously, and I'm not, I know I'm, I'm not talking, I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir here, but one of the things that just burns me up is when guys, when, 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 when our wives get older, you, you've seen it so many times. Our wives get older, and these husbands who have something to be attractive to younger women, either they're powerful or they have money or or they have some prestige and younger women looking for security will be attracted to them because the younger women say they can make my life secure, you know, and then, and then, and then he thinks, you know, that that means he's like, you know, attractive and then he leaves this one that's sacrificed her life for him for 40 years, who's given her best years of her life, her attractive years, her years when somebody else might want her when she could be, you know, 
productive and capable and now she's older and she you know she she's she's maybe a little more fragile and she she's gonna she she doesn't you know she doesn't have her youth anymore and now he is gonna leave her for some younger chick that he thinks is gonna make him younger in life and leave her out here in the cold when all, when she has used all of her life up making helping him become who he is. She sacrificed her whole life, and now he's going to walk away from her and throw her away. Who's going to want her? I mean, listen, tell me, who's going to want a, a 50-year-old, a 55-year-old woman who's, you know, who's older and she maybe has not a lot of skills because she's been at home with the kids and she's reared the kids and she's she hasn't been able to go to school because she didn't have time because she's got to rear her family so she's not educated she can't make a lot of money she can't provide a lot of income and stuff like that and who's wh what what are you doing you're throwing her away when she doesn't have the ability to now become capable for herself because she's given her best years to you and you're so reckless and careless and thoughtless and wicked and carnal and self-centered that you're going to throw her away because you're going to be attracted to somebody that you think will make you feel better about yourself. That, that's just, I'm telling you, that is the most evil thing that I can possibly think of somebody in the world doing. That is no honor. That is dishonoring everything about your wife and your relationship. So uh, honor your wives. Law number two, number, law number one, I'm sacrificing. I, I say, you march at the head, and I'll die for you as quick as I'll draw my next breath. You let her know that every day. She's going to be strengthened. You put her on the pedestal, and you give her the best, and you honor her. You respect her. You, you, you say you're the most valuable thing in the world to me, and I couldn't live without you. And every time you, she sees that, she's going to say, gosh, man, my man loves me. And the older she gets, the more you ought to do that because she becomes more insecure as she gets older. It's just a fact. God has built women with a little bit of insecurity built into you. I guarantee you, no matter how capable you are, no matter how productive you are, you can be the chairman of the board, women, of something in this world, and you can have a little bit of insecurity inside of you that always is saying, does my man love me? Am I valuable? Am I pretty? Am you know, does he want me? Does he still care about me? Does he still love me? Because God has built you with a little tinge of insecurity, and he's built men with a tinge of maybe even overconfidence, you know? And so, like magnetic dogs on a refrigerator opposite the track, boom, here we got the relationship, see? God's a genius. I'm, I'm serious. God, how do you get two beings that are so totally different to stay together? Well, you, you build them with with things they need from each other and magnetic, you know, dog going, here we go, you know, and you're, and you're to stick together. And God knows that. So he builds women with a little insecurity, builds men with a little overconfidence maybe in life, and presto, boom, you got, you got attraction. And so you honor your wives. All right, is there anything about that that you feel like we need to discuss? Anybody want to argue with it or anything? Or be me about that all right <laughs> all right well then moving along quickly we're going to move to um i hear you bill go ahead go ahead brother right right I do know what, yeah. Lift it up, like you said, but, you know, I'm glad you're a good housewife. Right. Good cook. Which is the next, the next law, right. actually. You're right. See, you way ahead of the game, man. Well, I had to learn hard. You had to learn hard way? <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I'm, I'm sure all of these guys in here have already know this. You, you've already learned this. Mm -hmm. Not wrong, just different. Not wrong, just different. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. I need to do that one one Sunday night or one sun, whatever, but anyway, it's a, that's a challenging word. Um, husband law number three, Bill, Billy just spoke and led right into it. It's the law of affirmation to affirm 
Um, Ephesians 5, uh, 25 and 26, let me read it again, and then I want to go in a direction off of 26 so, so you can see to, that affirmation, that to affirm, to speak positively is what it means, to, to create worth, to speak to value, to uplift someone. That's what to affirm them means, to lift them up, uh, brag on them. What it pretty much let them know how valuable they are with the words you speak. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, listen to it again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave herself, gave himself for her, very next verse, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. How? By the washing of water, last little phrase, by the word. And the word it, it does it's not capitalized. So it's not talking about the, the Word of God. It's not talking about the Bible. By the washing of water, by the Word. So small w. So what he's saying is, husbands, how do you sanctify them? How do you uh, wash them with, uh, with water uh, representing um, you, 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 you cleanse them and you... And you uh, strengthen them and you and you motivate them how do you do that by the word by what you say out of your mouth because women are created by God to be um, stimulated by what they hear women are stimulated more by what they hear and men are stimulated by what they see now this is a genius of God this also creates vulnerabilities. You know, the enemy takes what we really need and tries to use that against us so he can entice us and draw us away. So this is why pornography is so prevalent for men. This is why pornography is such a trap for men because the devil has taken a natural need in our life to be stimulated by what we see and he's put these images before us that get burned into our brain by, by uh, testosterone and all brain chemicals to look at these things that are beautiful and attractive and sexy and stimulating and all of that kind of stuff. And even when we're a young child that barely has gone through puberty and we can see these images, they stick in our brains because that chemical just burns it into us. And then we live a life thinking that that's normal. So when we, as our wives get older and, and they don't look like that anymore, and they're not, then all of a sudden we begin to kind of lose a little uh, 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 ability or desire to, to, to see them because we got this little craziness burned into our brain that says this is how women are supposed to look and this is how life, and then it just creates a downward spiral. See, this is the, this is the assault of the enemy. Why, why is that true? Because God built us men to be, to be enticed by what we see. So that's why it's so crazy. Now, women, you are built to be enticed by what you hear. In other words, guys, if you want to uh, uh, entice her, if you want to uh, create in her a desire, God says the way you do that is talk to her. And he gives us an example. Uh, I know that some of you have read it with me, the book of Song of Solomon. The book of Song of Solomon is the biblical form of pornography. I, I mean, I don't, and I'm not saying that disrespectful. I'm just saying that the, the Jewish people, the Jewish moms and dads would not allow their children to read the book of Song of Solomon until after they were bar mitzvahed. In other words, when they're bar mitzvahed, they're considered an adult. And the Jewish parents would not allow their children to read the Song of Solomon until after they were bar mitzvahed, which tells you that they say, this is for adults only. This is adult literature. And when you read the Song of Solomon, if you ever have, you will find yourself saying, wow, I did not know the Bible would say these things. It's Solomon's way of describing relationships between men and women. And what the book is about is the book is about a young prince, a young a virile man, and he's loved by a, a beautiful maiden, and they're separated from each other, and the maiden 
goes through the city calling out for the young man. And the Bible, and, and, and what's noticeable about it is uh, when she talks, she says, I love his voice. I love the sound of his voice. My beloved calls me from the... In other words, everything she says she's looking for concerns something she hears. And if you hear him speak, he will say, Have you seen my, the one my heart loves? She's like an ivory tower. Her lips are like, you know, her lips are like rubies. Her breasts are like towers. Her, I mean, he describes her by what he sees. And it just shows you how men and women are different. So if it, what I'm saying to you is the way that you get across to your wife that you, uh, that you love her is to affirm, to say words that speak to her and, and, uh, and, and let her know that you honor her because of, of, uh, of the things that you say to her in life. And you, if you want to keep the honey in the honeymoon, so to speak, you, you're going to have to talk to her. You're going to have to talk to her about her value to you. Oh, babe, I can't, I, I can't imagine living without you. But that, you're so awesome. I mean, just little things you say, little, little phrases. That was the greatest thing. I love the way you say that. Read it to me again. She writes up. Read it to me again. I just, I love to hear your voice. Just, I, don't, oh, I don't want to read it. Yeah, yeah, read it. I love to hear you talk. You know, just, just little, little things like that that, that are basically saying, uh, you're, you're beautiful. You're pretty. I mean, really, your wife wakes up every day, guys, saying, am I still pretty? Do I still excite you? Do you still want me? I mean, am I still sufficient for you? Am I still the center of your life? Do you still love me? I mean, really, you wake up every day thinking that. So if I'm your man and I'm going to say, you march at the head of my parade and I, don't, I want you to know it, you don't have to be so passionately overwhelmed. You got, you're, you're doing this because this is what the Scripture tells us to do. I mean, you're strategizing about this. You're planning for this. This is not just some spur of the moment, okay, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm going to do it. No, you strategically look for opportunities to do this because this is what she needs. She needs you to convince her, you're pretty. You still excite me. You're still the center of my life. I still love you more than anything else. You're wonderful. You, I, I honor you. I lift you up. You're, you're, still, my, you're still my honey in life. You still are the greatest thing I've ever come across on the face of God's earth. And if you can do that, see, that's affirmation. You, you're worthy. You're, you're special. I mean, I, I don't want anybody else but you. There's nobody. I, if I saw somebody, I think they, they're nothing compared to you. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they offer. I don't care what the devil might put in my mind. I I don't need anything else. You are the center of my life. You are the greatest thing on the face of this earth. That's affirmation. That's honor. You know, and you need to be aware of this and do this. And, and every day, you know, answer the question, am I still pretty? Oh, baby, you look beautiful. That's so awesome. Boy, that's your best color. You know, or whatever. Your hair. Oh, man, I love the way you're doing your hair today. I mean, look for opportunities to say these kind of things. Because that's what she needs to hear from you. And let me tell you something else. You need to do it face to face. Now, by that, let me tell you about this little study that was done by a university. They went to a high school. They, it, was, it, was a, it was a study on uh, men and women and, the, and how they uh, compare in the area of uh, personal dealings, personal communication. And, and listen to this. They, what they did is they went to a high school and they got about 50 women or teenage girls and about 50 teenage guys. And they brought them into the library and they took them and they put them uh, like one man, one boy and one girl, put them in a little conference room pretending that they needed to talk to them about so-and-so and they were going to interview them about so-and-so. All right, left them in there. And when they left them in there, 
The first thing they did is they took two guys and put them in there and then watch what happened. They had to walk out of the room and say, wait a minute, we'll be back in a few minutes. We got to go to the, and then, then record what happens between these two guys. And what they found was when they left two, two guys in there, that the two guys would sit down side by side, both of them looking probably straight ahead, and they would start talking to each other side by side. <laughs> And they would say things like, man, I tell you, this has been hot weather, and it, yeah, man, I don't know what's going on. And they just, and their conversation was side by side. Then they took two girls and put them in the room and watched what happened with them. And they found that the girls would not sit their chairs side by side. The girls would sit their chairs face to face. And they would talk to each other face to face. So what I'm saying is, guys, you need to communicate with her to affirm her face to face, which means you got to focus on her. It means you have to look at her. You talking to me? Now, let me tell you what this means practically. What this means practically is you can't sit on the couch by her watching TV and think that that's affirming. Or that's spending time, like quality time with your wife. I mean, you because you know why? Your focus is on TV. Your focus is on what's happening on the screen. And even though, you know, you may be communicating a little bit, like, oh man, did you see that? I guess, who do you think did it? You know, I mean that you're you're talking about that, it's still that's not really affirming. That's just, you know, that's some kind of little deal. We guys can do that. And that's good for us. That's side by side. You know, we just need somebody with us. But if we're going to communicate with our wives, it needs to be face to face. In other words, it needs to be focused. It needs to, it needs to be, have attention. It's like, have you ever been out to eat? How long have you guys been married, most of you? I mean, how, how many years? Yeah, y'all are newly married. Yeah. 30 years? You guys, 30 years, 10, 9, 40 years. Uh, Lawrence, how long y'all been married? 15 years. 15 years, Bree, 40 years, 47 years, <laughs> glory to God, you've learned the secret. Bree, what, how long have y'all been married? Just newlyweds? It's, yeah. It's still under a year. Under a year? Oh, you don't count. Yeah. Um, how about, how about, Mitch, you and Sharon, how many years? 16, you said? Ooh, 16, you're moving right along, babe. Yeah, yeah. But you've been to a restaurant and you've watched uh, pe couples in the restaurant, have you wa noticed what they do? All right, you get people that have been married as long as all of us. What is likely to happen at a restaurant when people that have been married as long as us go out to eat? If you watch them, a lot of times nowadays, if they're still young enough to be able to see, they, they, have, their, they have the little cell phone out and, and that one's looking at this and this one's looking at this and the waitress comes along and what do you want and you tell her and then the other one tells her and then you, and then you might say a little something like, oh, and then you're back doing that or you're looking at the menu or you're looking around at the crowd, who's there. But, but you're, not, you're not communicating. But you watch a young couple, you watch these little hot-blooded young ones and when they go in to eat, what are they doing? She's got her hands on the table. He's got his hands on the table. He's holding her hand. They're, he's looking at her. She's looking at him, and they're just talking to each other. And then, you know, he might kiss her hand or something. He might, I mean, you're wanting to say to him, get a room, or, you know. <laughs> and, and you can just feel. Come here to eat you can, more. right, yeah, yeah, you can feel. And what I'm saying is he's totally focused on her. She's totally focused on him. It's face to face. He's not distracted by something going on over here. He's not looking at his phone. He's not reading the menu. He's, he's communicating face to face. Everything is saying to her, you know, you are the center. You are the focus. You are, and, and he's just kissing. It was like uh, 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 an older couple saw this happening uh, where the wife said to the husband, look at that over there. Look at that. Have you ever seen anything like that? He's looking right at her. Ooh, he's kissing her hand. He's honoring her and all that. And she looked at her husband and said, why don't you do that? And he said, well, honey, I don't even know her. You know? So, <laughs> so you know, no. Right. I would, but I don't even know her, you know? But, no, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> 
I'm just saying to you that, you know, that is the, that is the law of affirmation. And to affirm her, you have to focus on her. I, this is not something you can do from the, from, you're in the bathroom and she's in the bedroom and you say, oh, by the way, you know you're the greatest, right? <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. It means before you leave the house that morning, if you want to affirm her, you look at her in the face, focus totally on her, looking at her and saying, you know, boy, babe, you look, you're beautiful today. You're beautiful today. <laughs> Yeah, you're beautiful today, and I can't wait to get home this afternoon. You know, or, or whatever. You know, you know your whatever your personality will allow, and what you know, everybody's not the same on what you might say and how you might say it. But but look for opportunities to do that. That's face to face. That's what she needs. So yeah, you need to see what it is. Yeah, somebody was at the door. But anyway. All right, so the law of affirmation, all right? The next law for men is uh, the law of, hang on just a second, the law of security. Oh, this is a big one. All of them are big, right? Mm -hmm. The law of sacrifice, the law of honor, the law of affirmation. All right, so how do we show our wives we love them? Um, we die for as quickly as we draw our next breath. You need to communicate that every day. Uh, or as often as you possibly can. The law of honor means I, I, I elevate her, I put her up in my life. The law of affirmation means I communicate face to face every day that you are great, that you are awesome, that you are honorable, so there you go. And then number four for the law for men is the law of security, law of security. I talked about this just a, just a little bit a while ago, but just kind of take this thing a little bit further. In the book of Ruth, are you guys familiar with the book of Ruth? Yep. The book of Ruth in the Bible is a story about a, a Hebrew woman that has been taken by her husband to a foreign land. And, this la and her husband, and they have two children, two boys, and they name one of them sickly and they name the other one piney. <laughs> which... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Malin and the other one, as I can't remember exactly. Chilion. And who? Chilion. Yeah, Chilion. Malin and Chilion, which means one means sickly and the other means pining. Uh, that's, real love. that's real love. Yeah, that's real love. And then the husband dies in this foreign land, and this Hebrew wife now is alone with no husband in a foreign land with two boys that are sickly and pining. And these two boys then die, so there's no males to provide for her. So she says, I'm going back home, I'm going back to Israel, and I have some relatives back there, and I, 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 I'm, I'm getting old, and I need to, to get away from all of this. And, and so she says, I'm going back, Well, she has a young maiden that is her servant girl, and her name is Ruth. And Ruth says to her that famous statement that gets quoted at weddings all the time whenever, whenever she looks at her, when Naomi is her name, when Naomi looks at her and says, hey, I'm going back home, and she says, you need to stay here with your people because I have no more sons and I don't have anything to offer you, and even if I had a son right now, it would take time for him to grow up, so are you going to wait for him? Are you going to, you know, you wouldn't... You're, you'd be too old once he got old enough to marry you, so you need to stay here and let your people take care of you. You're still young and attractive. You can still attract a man. So I'm going to go I'm going to go back to my people because I'm old and I don't have any skills and I need somebody to try to help take care of me and I'm going back home let my family, you know, get in my family and try to, and, and, and you need to stay here. And Ruth is one of the girls. She has two of these, two of these young servant girls and the other one says, okay, you're right, I'm going to stay here. But Ruth looks at her, and Ruth says, wherever you go, I'm going. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And whatever happens to you is going to happen to me, and I promise to stay with you, and I'm not going to leave you because I realize my future is tied to you. And so Ruth goes back. Now, Ruth is not a Jewish girl. Ruth is a... Now considered a, 
an outcast. You know, I mean, she's from another land and another people. And so Naomi finds her way to Israel and just so happens, you know, as God arranges things that just so happen, it just so happens that Ruth finds her, her relative a man of means, a man of substance, a man that has some land and has some servants and, and has some money and has some provisions. And Ruth finds him. He's, he's a relative of her, and his name is Boaz. And Boaz has some fields. And so Ruth, the young Moabitess, finds these fields, and Naomi gives her instructions and tells her, okay, you go out in the fields. And when the gleaners, when the, when the servants of Boaz have gone through a field and gotten everything out of the field that they want, there are going to be some stubbles left behind. There are going to be some, some grains left behind because there was a law in Israel that said if you're rich and you have lands, for, so for the poor people, you got to leave some things on purpose. And... And so these, these, these gleaners did, and, 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 Naomi, and, and Ruth went out in the field, and Naomi told her, all right, you know, be pretty. Uh, you, you, you got good looks, use it, baby. Work everything you've got. And she says, she says, you come in from the fields, and she says, let me tell you what, Boaz is going to be at this, at this celebration tonight, and Boaz is, is a good man, and Boaz has some money, and Boaz uh, likes pretty women. And so you come over here. Let me put your makeup on. Let me paint your lips for you. Let me get you all pretty and everything so he'll notice you. And so Ruth goes to the banquet that night, and Boaz sees her, and Boaz is attracted to her, and Boaz looks at her, and he said, Hey, I haven't seen you around before, and... I noticed that you're really not from here, are you? And she says, no. And so they strike up a little conversation. And then that night, that night, I mean, the Bible's full of stuff like this. That night, uh, she comes home and, and Ruth and Naomi says, hey, did he notice you? And she said, yeah, he did. And do you think he, you think he was attracted to you? Yeah. She, and then here's what she says. She says, tonight, Boaz is going to go to sleep at a certain place. And what I want you to do is I want you to doll up, put your, put your frou-frou on, put your perfume on, get yourself beautiful, uh, put on these little nighty kind of things, and you go up there where he is, and where he's sleeping, you lift up the blanket and you get under there with him, and when he notices you, uh, then you be as accommodating as possible, and and he'll and he'll be attracted to you and 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 he'll have affection for you and he'll you know I mean he'll want you which is I mean did you know the Bible talks and teaches stuff like this yeah I mean telling you how to do this is how you do fru fru yourself get pretty put your makeup on be attractive man that's how you get that's how these men, why because men are stimulated by what they see. So let them see the greatest. Let them see you. And sure enough, Boaz, Boaz responds. And he says, what do you want from me? And she says, I want you to take your cover, and I want you to cover me. Which is her way of saying, I want to, I want to be under your protection. I want to be under your care. I want to trust in you and for you to, to provide for me. I want to be covered by you is what she's saying to him. And you know what happens the next day? The next day, he said, all right, you get with my gleaners. Don't, don't get behind them and pick up the little rubbles. You, you get with my people, and that way you'll be protected so none of these old vagrant men can look at you and attack you and rape you and molest you. You get with them and they'll protect you and you get the best, you, you, you know, you get the best of the fields. And so, and anyway, the point is about that is what is, what is Ruth asking for? She's asking for security. She's asking, look, 
I have no man to provide for me. Therefore, I'm insecure. I don't know what's going to happen to me. From day to day, I don't know where my living is going to come from. I don't know where my provisions is going to come from. And I need to feel safe. I need to feel secure. I need to know that my needs are met and that I'm not going to starve to death or I'm not going to be molested. I'm going to be attacked. I'm not going to have to sell my body for what I'm worth and you know try to be uh, taken by some man who may or may not love me or want me or provide for me. I need, to, I need some security in life. And what that tells us is it's important, men, in every way possible for you to say to your wife, uh, I'll, I, I, I'm providing. I got you. We're in this together. You're not, I'm not going to let you suffer. I, I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to get enough provision for us. I'm not going to let us go under. I'm, I'm, I, I love you. I, I'm never going to leave you. I, uh, you're the greatest thing in my life. I honor you. I affirm you. You're safe with me. I would die for you as quickly as I draw my name. And what this gives her is security, which is one of the major emotional needs of women. They need to be secure. Guys, you wonder why they ask so many questions? Where are we going? When are we going to get there? What's going to happen then? What did your boss say today? Is everything all right in the office? I mean, all these kind of questions. Those are questions that make her secure when you answer them. You say, boy, she asked a lot of questions. You know why? Because you don't tell her anything. If you want her to be secure, you got to tell her stuff before she has to ask you about it. And when she says, "Way, well, how was work today? What's your answer? Fine. <laughs> You think you've totally explained everything by that one word, fine. Yeah. yeah, fine, that just covers everything. What she's saying is, is your job secure? Is there any reason for you to worry that your boss doesn't like you and you're going to get fired? You're going to, you know, I mean, are you on the way up? or is, Are things looking good? Are things looking bad? I mean, these are security questions. Did, do you have a good relationship with everybody there? Did everything go all right? Are you on the outs with somebody that's going to be detrimental to your job and your provision? I mean, it's not like women are just completely paranoid about life, but I'm just telling you that the questions that they ask many times are questions about, should I be worried? Is life shaky? Are we good? You know, is everything going good? Or, or do I need to worry about some of this stuff that might affect our life and our livelihood and our living? I mean, it's like when, when, uh, when, when you say, uh, all right, let's go out to so-and-so tonight. Let's go to eat at so-and-so. Uh, where are you going? I mean, are you going to McDonald's or are you going to some five-star restaurant? Do you think it's important that, you, that she would know which one that you're going to? Why would she need to know that? Well, she needs to know how to dress. She needs to know how to put blue jeans on or fix up and doll up, and we're going out somewhere special. And secondly, how can we afford this? I mean, did we get a raise? I mean, do you have some kind of bonus coming in, or how can we afford it? Why would she be worried about that? Well, it's our finances, it's our life. Man, we're on the borderline. We got a house note coming up and a car note coming up. Are we going to be able to pay that and go out and spend $100 for a meal here? I mean, what, you know? And, and who's going to take care of the kids? Uh, what's going to happen to them, you know? I mean, are we just going to leave them here at the house by themselves? Or do I, do, right, or do, I, or do we need to call mama, you know, to take care of them? Or what, what are we going to hire a babysitter, and who's that going to be? And what time are we going to leave because I need to know when I need to start getting ready? I mean, these are all the questions that women begin to ask. Why? Because they need to know these things. And I'm just telling you, before they ask about them, tell them these things. Talk to them. Speak to them. Let them know these answers. If you don't want them asking all these questions, start telling them stuff before they ask for it. And start realizing that this is a need for security in life. This is a need women have. They, you, women, you, you need to be secure. You wonder, you wonder why women get so upset when things get shaky. It's because it undermines their security. 
And of course, they're going to be nervous. They're going to be anxious. They're going to be filled with anxiety because this is saying, oh, no, is our, what's happening to us? Are we going to fumble, fumble fall? Are we going, we going to make it? I mean, is this going to be a major tragedy? I mean, come on. Do, I mean, do I need to get a job? Do, you know, what are we, what's happening here? And I mean, this undermines the security of a wife. And according to the word, men, it's our responsibility to meet that need and make them know that everything's okay. We're secure, we're stable. Hey, don't worry about it, we got it. We're on the good, where things are being provided for, um, we're being capable, uh, I'm thinking about our future, uh, all this stuff, I, I've, I've planned and I know where we are, I know what we can afford, I know what we're doing, and I, I just want you to come on out because uh, you deserve it. You know, you, we deserve a, a little time away, you know, from the kids. Don't take the kids everywhere you go. Leave those critters at home, you know. I mean, you can't have an intimate dinner when you've got them with you all the time. I mean, look, look, understand that, I mean, if you want to be uh, honored, loved, exalted, respected, and so forth, you got to play your part too. you got to say, I mean, you can't, take little diversions with you everywhere you go. You gotta, I mean, how could you, how could you be intimate with, with, with a little crying baby at your side? That, that child's a year old. You think it can't survive a couple of hours without you? You need to separate yourself from that. And you need to say to your husband, you're more valuable to me than this one is. And he needs to know that. You want him to meet your needs, you got to meet some needs in his life, too. And so, anyway, we'll talk about that next week. But we're talking about how you can help. So, okay, so we got the law of sacrifice, we got the law of honor, we got the law of affirmation, and then we've got the law of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of security. And then now the, the last law for men is the law of excitement. Law of excitement. Well, you know what this law means? Put a little hot sauce on it. <laughs> it means, uh, look, you, you need some you need some spice in your life sometimes, because life can get you know life there life can become a, a drudgery. I mean, just think about the the laws of I mean the the daily lives of some women. What what does it involve? Well, it involves uh, a routine, and the routine of taking care of the children. Uh, fixing the meals, washing the clothes, um, sweeping the house, I mean, making everything nice and attractive and fluffing the pillows and, and taking care of the kids going to school, getting the homework up, doing, I mean, the, the routine. A Working a full-time job, yeah. In other words, the life of your wife can become mundane. It can become routine. And, and the scripture says... Guys, it's our responsibility to, to put a little excitement in there. Fluff it up a little bit. Pour a little hot sauce on it. Surprise her, you know. Uh, be, be spontaneous on some stuff. Uh, do some stuff just because you know she needs a, a, little, a little lift, a little pick-me-up in life, a little happy, you know. Now... The thought of this comes from one of the miracles that Jesus did. The first miracle that Jesus did. Let me share it with you. You'll remember it. The first miracle that Jesus ever performed was at a wedding. The wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the, at that wedding, they gave out of wine. You remember this? And the mother of Jesus, Mary, was there. And Mary came to Jesus. And Mary said, son... They have run out of wine. And Jesus says, uh, what is that to me? I'm, I, mine hour has not yet come. In other words, it's not time for me to, to expose myself to, to the fact that I can do miracles, you know. And, but anyway, nevertheless, she, Mary looks at the servants and Mary says to the servants, hey, whatever he says to you, do it. Trust me, just do what he says. Jesus looks at them and commands them, go get some water pots. And they get six water pots, uh, the number of man, uh, weakness of man. 
They take the water pots and they fill them up to the brim with water, which is an, an express, I mean, we're gonna get everything we can. We're gonna, we're gonna fill them to the brim. We're not gonna half fill them, three quarter fill them. We're gonna fill them to the brim. When Jesus said fill them, he meant fill them all the way to the top. They go fill them to the brim. They bring them to Jesus. The water in the presence of the glory of God gets sunburned, turns into wine. The servants take the water that's turned to wine and they start giving it to the guest at the wedding. The guests begin to exclaim, Hey, who, who keeps the best stuff for the last? What most people do is they give them the best stuff first, and then when you get drunk enough that you can't really tell the difference, then they start serving them the poor, the poor hooch, you know? So, but you have served us the poor stuff to start with, and now you've saved the best to last which is an illustration of a lot of things about God, that he gives us the best and he gives, and the st stuff that God gives is, so, is the best and, and, and it's at the end of things, we get the best of life. But anyway, the point being that what did Jesus do at that wedding? Jesus spiced it up. Jesus added excitement to a wedding by miraculously giving them something that was the best greatest and they were so surprised it was out of the mundane it was out of the ordinary Jesus put a little hot sauce into that situation and what I'm saying is that's an illustration guys of what I'm talking about when I say the law of excitement that I mean spark it up a little bit look for ways to be spontaneous look for ways to to be um, to be alluring to be to be to be uh, uh, capable and responsible of bringing a little excitement. You come home from work. Hey, babe, let's go out tonight. And yeah, let's go. Put on your dress. Put on your. We go. We gonna paint the town, baby. We going. We going all out tonight. You know. Or we're going to walk on the beach. Let's go down. And, let's go down to the beach. You know, we hadn't been down there in a long time. Come on. Yeah. Put you. Yeah. Put your flip flops on. Let's walk in the sand. Let's go down there to the beach or. I mean, it doesn't have to be something expensive. It can be just something that's, you know, different in life. Or, you know, we're going to go and let's go, let's go down to one of the, let's go down one of the casinos and walk in the room and let's go to ballroom and dance or let's go to a show or what, I mean, you know, I mean, it just, it, in other words, do something that's not typical for you. That's a little bit out of the, out of the flow of everything so that, uh, you can make life more enjoyable, really, is what it boils down to. That you can say, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to get in, caught in the drudgery of life. I want you to, to have the best. I want you to enjoy life. Are you happy being my wife? Or is our life happy? Are you satisfied? I mean, I need, I want to know if there's anything I can do to make life better for you, but, but I'm going to try my best to, to give you a reason to be excited today. You get something to look forward to. Tell them in the morning, hey, uh, when I get home from work this afternoon, we're going to do this, or we're going to... And look for ways, look for different things you can do. And like I said, they don't... It's not that they're expensive. It's not that, you know, you do some big costly thing. It's just that you do something out of the ordinary. I mean, you know, we're going to... We're going to go, we're going to ride around, we're going to look at, 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 at the place where we might want our next house, you know. And then you ride around, you talk to them, man, it's going to be something, isn't it? We're going to get us this, and this is going to be where we live, and we're going to want something like that. I mean, whatever it is, you know the personality of your mate. You know what they need. You know, you know what excites them. Uh, what, and, and you do that. Use it. And so that's the law of excitement. And when you do that... Um, the wife perceives that as love. That when she's looking through her glasses, her glasses say, he loves me. I march at the head of his parade. Oh, he's so committed to me. Life is good. I'm, so, I'm stable. We're stable. We're secure. He doesn't want anybody else but me. He thinks I'm the greatest. He lifts me up. He doesn't want anybody but me. He's not attracted to all these frou-frou women around him. I mean, think, a lot of men are surrounded every day by women who are at their best, you know. They look the best. They smell the best. They got their hair fixed. They got their makeup on. They got the, you know, and they're presenting the best side of them. And that's the people he works around all day long. 
And you can feel a little bit intimidated by that sometimes, maybe. You know, you can say, well, I mean, I know he's got beautiful this and beautiful that. And, one, and do, I, do, I, am I, do, he, do I still excite him? Do I still, do I still fulfill his needs? You know, I mean, is his glass full? Is he attracted to somebody else? No, no. See, all of that undermines, undermines your relationship. And, the, and God says, guys, it's up to you to convince them that that's not true and that they march at the head of your parade and that your life revolves around them. Just like you promised when you married them. You made a commitment, an oath, and uh, God expects us to fulfill it. All right, is there any observation about that or any, uh, any questions or any points you'd like to make about any of that? Or does that kind of get through to you? Does that, does that kind of tell you? Okay, now you see, with that right there, guys, those five things right there, if you do those five things, you're going to give your marriage the best chance to be successful. But you see now why I said if you don't do these things, no matter how passionate or how skilled uh, your marriage seems to be at the moment, it, over a long period it's not going to endure because those five things I just named are completely needed by women. Not just wanted, but needed. A need is a need, and it must be supplied. And God says, guys, it's your responsibility to do this. So love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's our responsibility. Okay? Okay, no, no words, no observations, no requests for prayer. No. <laughs> okay. All right, let's stand. We'll be just.